Hey everyone, this is going to be the first of a two video series where I'm going to talk about combustion analysis. And combustion analysis is basically a very popular method that is used to determine the chemical formulas of certain compounds. So the basic, the basically it, it breaks down like this. So this is what your basic combustion analysis apparatus is going to look like. And it consists of a furnace with your sample inside. And it also consists of a U-shaped tube that contains a material that absorbs water. And then connected to that is another U-shaped tube containing a material that absorbs CO2. So basically the way that this works is before actually burning your sample, what you're going to do is you're going to allow oxygen gas to continuously flow through this system. This is called purging the system. So you're purging the system with oxygen gas. You're forcing out all that air and you have nothing but oxygen continuously flowing through the system and once you have sufficiently purged your system what you do then is you ignite your sample and this is usually accomplished uh, by a copper wire that is connected to your sample and also to the leads of a power source so once you turn on that power source that sparks up your sample and then because oxygen is continuously being added to the system that allows your sample to undergo complete combustion and the two products of combustion are water and carbon dioxide. So as you can imagine, the water gets absorbed by your H2O absorber, the carbon dioxide gets absorbed by your CO2 absorber, and then anything uh, else basically passes through the system and is not absorbed. So the basic idea here is we're trying to figure out how much water and how much carbon dioxide uh, came from our sample once we allowed it to undergo combustion. And then once we find out how much water and carbon dioxide came from that sample, then we can calculate how much carbon and how much hydrogen came from that sample, and then we can get a little bit closer to figuring out the chemical formula of that compound. So it basically breaks down like this. So this is the uh, your basic uh, chemical equation for combustion. And I haven't really gone over chemical equations in my screencast series yet, uh, but this is basically the way it works. So you have your sample, and your sample contains carbon, and it also contains hydrogen, and it might contain uh, other, el other elements as well. And you, again, you're burning that sample in an excess amount of oxygen gas, O2. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, the products of combustion are carbon dioxide and water. And just by looking at our, uh, at our products, we can observe that the only combustion product that contains hydrogen is the water. In other words, there's no there's no hydrogen in CO2. There is only hydrogen in in water. That's the only one of our product the only one of our products that has hydrogen. Likewise, the only product that contains carbon is CO2. There is no carbon in water. So therefore, all of the carbon coming from your sample must be converted into CO2. Again, this is assuming that your uh, your sample is undergoing complete combustion. And also, all of the hydrogen coming from your sample must be converted to H2O. Oops, there it is. And any other elements uh, that are in, any other elements that are in your sample uh, can be determined by subtraction. So, what do I mean by that? Well, if you have the if you have the mass of your original sample before you started the reaction, and you were able to calculate the masses of carbon and hydrogen uh, just by analyzing your combustion products. Well, you can take the mass of your original sample, and then you, you can subtract from that the combined masses of carbon and hydrogen that you figured out by analyzing the combustion products, and that can give you the mass of your element, uh, your other element, other than carbon dioxide that you originally had. So uh, I know that sounds like a mouthful, but uh, it's always good to, uh, to do these examples. Uh, so let's go ahead and do an example. So it says that a compound that contains only carbon and hydrogen undergoes combustion and produces 7.32 grams of CO2 and 3.60 grams of water. And we're asked to find the empirical formula of the compound. So basically, when, when, uh, when we say empirical formula, we want to know the formula that contains the relative numbers of atoms of each element in the compound. And uh, another way to say the another way to express the empirical formula is to uh, express the relative numbers of moles of atoms of each element in the compound. So basically, what we need to do is we need to start by taking these masses that we've been given and converting them into moles. So I'm going to start with my CO2. 
So we have our 7.32 grams of CO2. I'm going to use the molar mass of CO2 to convert from grams of CO2 to moles of CO2. Again, this molar mass, this 44.01 grams per mole, this was determined by adding the molar mass of carbon to twice the molar mass of oxygen. And again, these molar masses can be uh, found from the periodic table. So now we have moles of CO2, but we need to convert that into moles of carbon, right? And the way that we convert moles of CO2 into moles of carbon is we use the conversion factor that is inherent in the chemical formula of CO2, which is one mole of CO2 to one mole of carbon. Now I know this looks like a very trivial conversion. I mean, we're just multiplying by one and dividing by one, so our number is gonna be the same, but our unit is gonna be different. Our unit is gonna be moles of carbon, not moles of CO2, and this is very important because we don't want moles of CO2. We wanna know what the amount of carbon is in moles that we started with before the compound was allowed to undergo combustion. So again, the conversion, this conversion factor came from just the chemical formula for CO2. The fact that there was only one atom, one carbon atom in, uh, in every CO2 molecule means that there is one mole of CO2, or excuse me, one mole of carbon in every mole of CO2. So let's go ahead and make sure that our units cancel out. So we have grams of CO2 cancels with grams of CO2. Moles of CO2 cancels with moles of CO2. And we're left with 0 0.166 moles of carbon. So we're going to do the same thing with the hydrogen, starting out with our mass of water. So we have our 3.60 grams of water. I'm going to use the molar mass of water, 18.02 grams per mole, to convert from grams of water to moles of water. Now, once I have moles of water, I'm going to, I'm going to use the, uh, the uh, conversion factor in the chemical formula for water to convert from moles of water to moles of hydrogen. And that is, there is one mole, or excuse me, there are two moles of hydrogen per one mole of water. And again, this is because there are two hydrogen atoms in every water molecule. So let's go ahead and make sure our units cancel out. We have grams of water canceling with grams of water. Moles of water cancels here and here. And this gives us, this gives us 0 0.400 moles of hydrogen. So we have just determined the relative amounts in moles of carbon and hydrogen in our original starting material uh, before the combustion reaction took place. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, using these two amounts, I'm going to write a pseudo formula for our compound. So our pseudo formula is C 0.166 H 0 0.400. Uh, we can't leave that formula as is because we need whole numbers in our chemical formula. So basically what we need to do is we need to figure out the greatest common factor of these two numbers. We have to figure out the largest number that divides evenly into both of these numbers so that we can find our empirical formula. So the way that you would find the greatest common factor of two numbers is you would start by, it's basically a trial and error process. So what you do is you start by dividing by the smallest of the two numbers. And if that doesn't, if that doesn't work, in other words, if that smallest value doesn't divide cleanly into both of your numbers, then you would try half of the smallest value. And then if that didn't work, you would try a third of the smallest value and so on and so forth until you find uh, the greatest common factor. So let's start again by dividing by the smallest value, which of course is that 0 0.166, and that gives us the following. So that gives us CH 2.41. So 2.41 obviously isn't a whole number, so the smallest value didn't work, so now we have to move on to half of the smallest value. And this gives us this formula here, C2H 4.82. 4.82, that's obviously not a whole number, so we got to keep going. So now we got to move on to, the, to a third of the smallest value, and that gives us this formula. Again, we don't have any whole numbers. Now, I know I'm going through these quickly, and it, it takes a lot longer uh, when you haven't already calculated these like I have. But um, again, you got to practice these. Make sure you can do them quickly. Uh, so that you're not pressed for time on your exam. 
Okay, so we just used a third of the smallest value and that didn't work, so now we have to move on to a fourth of the smallest value. And that gives us this formula here. And 9.64, that's close, but again, that's not a whole number, so we have to keep going. This is tedious, I know, but again, this is how you have to do it. And I'm, you know, for, for these, for large uh, molecules and stuff, I'm sure they have uh, software that does this for them, but if uh, technology crashed on us, you know, we, we would be okay in this case. <laughs> so basically, uh, like I said, so a fourth of the smallest value didn't work. Now we have to move on to a fifth of the smallest value. And finally, we have our empirical formula, C5H12. So like I said, that's a very tedious process, uh, but that's how you do it. And again, this is the empirical formula of the compound. It's not necessarily the molecular formula. The molecular formula could be C5H12. It could be C10H24. It could be C15H36. It could be any whole number multiple of C5H12. And uh, so that's basically it. Um, uh, at, <laughs> you may not be able to believe it, but uh, the examples actually get a little bit harder than this. Uh, in the next example, I'm going to do a, uh, a combustion analysis problem that involves a, a compound that contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And as we will see, uh, whenever you have uh, a third element, it actually gets a little bit more tedious and a little bit more involved. So I hope this video helped you, out, you guys out a little bit. And uh, all right, good luck.